good afternoon. Let us start with a moment of silence. Thank you. I want to welcome you here this afternoon, and I know we're an intimate group, but I'm using this because there are people whose voices sometimes don't carry, and it's important that you hear the words and the thoughts that are going to be shared this afternoon. I'm Rebecca Geary, and I have met many of you, but I'm the Executive Director of the Farming Wilderness and Nineveh Foundations. And it's, this is the first time I've announced myself that way, so Ooh, if you want to know more about it, <laughs> if you want to know more about it, stick around at dinner or come see me later this evening. This is really um, more than a dedication. It is a chance for us to honor somebody who has um, been an integral part of the community. And I just want to appreciate all of you that are here and I know you're going to hear from Christy and Janet and, and, and others, but for me, it's, it's for someone who doesn't have the history of farm and wilderness that many of you do, it's really powerful to think about how one person can mean so much to a community decades later. And so for me, that's been my experience since I've begun at farm and wilderness, and I'm just honored to be able to be a part of this celebration and, and appreciation of Al Hicks and to be able to dedicate this kitchen in his name. So I want to welcome all of you and just get a sense of how many of you were campers at Farm and Wilderness at some point in your lives. Okay, and if your hands stay up, how many of you were staff at Farm and Wilderness? Whoa. <laughs> okay, and how many of you were parents of campers or staff? <laughs> And how many, of you, how many of you have no clue what farm and wilderness is, but you came for the sticky buns? <laughs> okay, with that, I'd like to pass this on to Janet, who is going to, um, to get us started. Thank you, Rebecca. And for somebody who came new to the camp, it's now been, what, three years, four years? And so it's not new anymore, but I know when I came here in 1973, I felt like I was a newbie. And now I feel like I'm an oldie, except <laughs> <laughs> now, while we're here today, <laughs> I don't feel so much, and I don't mean an old person. <laughs> I mean an oldie in camp years. <laughs> so I feel um, very honored to be here, and my job is to thank you. And as many of you know, I have spoken in front of Farmer Wilderness groups many times. And for some reason today, it made me a little more nervous. And I'm not quite sure what that is, but fortunately, I have these notes. So I wanted to tell you that, um, oh, before I started, I wanted to tell you another thing. This is one of the few places I go where we don't make the initial announcement Please turn your cell phones off. <laughs> so it's really, that's quite a pleasure. But I'm here to thank you. And thank you uh, for coming. And thank you for supporting Al 
is Al's memory at camp and for recognizing his impact. And thank you for your financial support that helped build this kitchen. And I would also like to recognize um, the board of directors of Farm and Wilderness, both uh, current and past, and because there are some of us who are in the audience now. And um, just to say that our board has been very strong in supporting this, this campaign to build this kitchen, and it was a priority of the board. Now this would never have happened without the wonderful staff we have. And so there are many thank yous that go around today. And now I think what we want to do is hear a little bit more about Al. And so I'm going to give the microphone to someone who knew him and his family knew him quite well. Christy. Come right here. Thank you. Thanks, um, I'm actually not one of those who requires a microphone. The <laughs> word loud mouth is often um, used, but I will try to stick with the program. My name is Christy Webb. I am Ken and Susan's <coughs> oldest granddaughter. Um, and what I really love about gatherings like this is that it's one of the few times where there are people in the room who've been here longer than I have. Um, I, I, really, I really like that. I didn't get here until 1961, so um, it's been nice to talk with folks who predate me. Um, I also want to bring greetings from a number of people who were not able to be here today. Jeffrey M. Tatum is one. Becca Steinitz is another. Um, my husband, Todd Werner, is, um, wants to be remembered to certain people. <coughs> when I was eight and in crickets, and he was nine and in week one, he asked me to dance at a square dance right over there um, in what at that time was the corner, and um, look, we're married. <laughs> machine. Um, I, I bring some stories, some, um, uh, I, I have permission to share these from some other people. One is from, a couple are from Judy Muja, um, whom some of you may have known as Judy Palmer before she married Al Muja. She says that in the summer of 1959, just as she and Al Muja, not Al Hicks, just as she and Al Muja got engaged, um, she says four of us went to Rutland, to Seward's, which many of us will remember as the big ice cream place to get, um, and ordered a, uh, a brown cow, which was a root beer and ice cream float on their day off. And she said that there were two women there at the counter who were obviously not at all pleased that there was a, an African-American man with three white people. And so sitting there at the counter, she says, Al and I caught each other's eye, and without even hesitating, we both unwrapped our straws, popped them in the same root beer float, and gazing into each other's eyes adoringly, while I waggled yes. my, <laughs> my rock, <laughs> my, my great rock of an engagement ring, um, we just enjoyed that root beer float. And she says those women did not stay around very long. <laughs> I often think of the tremendous courage that it must have taken um, in 1951 for a young man of color to come to Vermont, uh, thereby increasing the population of people of color in Vermont by at least 100%. Um, he came to us, he was at that time still a student at this college and um, was with us nearly continually until his death in 1984. He was, um, he, there was a break while he was in the military uh, serving. Um, Judy has another story. She says that there was a, a point at which, one summer at which, um, she was down at, at the time it was called Oldenburg's, it's the, the corner store down in, in West Bridgewater. And she was um, just coming out the door and uh, Al, Al did not drive. Uh, but somebody had driven him up, and they had pulled into the, the gas station or whatever. And she caught sight of him. She came flying off the porch, dove, dove, dove in through the window of the car to give him a big hug. She said there was, not unlike today, a group of bicyclists who had stopped there and were just, you know, sitting there on the porch in the rocking chairs. And when she came back onto the porch, one of them looked at her and said, wow, this is really a good place to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Al worked 
very long hours here as, as a cook. Um, he got up extremely early while it was still dark. He worked very late. And um, as far as I know, he always lived in what we called Al's Palace, which was, uh, still is, um, a little cabin. Um, if you're at Tamarack Farm, it's just a little bit over the hill from what is now the Arts Farm. Uh, there by the maintenance shed, just, just a little bit down the hill towards the lake. Um, he brought young men from the inner city of New York with him each summer, and one of the things that he did was get them out into the woods before they got here to introduce them to what it would be like to be in a place where there are no lights at night, where there's wildlife. There's chipmunks and you know porcupines and raccoons and I, I, he probably didn't mention the bears, but just, um, but he would he would train these young men. Some of whom have gone on to be chefs. In um, there's uh, one young man is a chef in um, has been a chef in a series of restaurants in Atlanta. Um, others in the New York area. He um, very very quietly made it financially possible for some of them to go to college. But he must have been exhausted. So there was a memorable occasion where um, one of the Vermont health inspectors showed up. Where's Paul Stone? Don't listen to this one. Um, Paul is the former um, <laughs> director of agriculture, right? Just stop your ears or something. Um, a uh, health inspector for the state of Vermont shows up to inspect the kitchen uh, long before this gorgeous thing we have here. <laughs> uh, walked in the kitchen doors to find that Al was stretched out on the metal counter, sound asleep, just laid out like a corpse there. Uh, fortunately, the health inspector had a sense of humor uh, about the whole thing, and we still passed our, uh, our health inspection. Um, Al... Um, my first memory of Al was uh, in 1961. Uh, my little sister was born during camp. Um, I had the courage of my mother to be nine months pregnant going up and down the hills. That's another topic for another day. Um, but, but I thought that this was a wonderful thing because Al, it was my sister's birthday, literally. It was, oh, it was also Grandma Susan's birthday. And Grandma Susan was the birthday queen. You just did not get in the way of her and her birthday. Um, despite the fact that she had an identical twin sister. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's probably part of the problem. But Al made me a birthday cake. And I was, 1961, I was six years old. Um, and I just thought that this was wonderful, that there's a new baby and I get the cake. I just thought that was the best thing. Ever. I mean, I had just, that, what a thoughtful thing to do for a little one. Um, I just, he, was, he was an immensely kind and thoughtful man. He was a personal friend of Leontine Price, the opera singer. Um, I am given to understand that he was drop-dead gorgeous in a tux. He uh, was. He was. <laughs> <laughs> he was. We have, we have uh, personal testimony. Uh, and he was, um, he inspired generations of children in the schools in Harlem. Uh, he was a history teacher. Um, he inspired generations here. We just kind of have to look around the room, and um, in a moment, others. I want to hear stories from others as well about Al. Um, Al is um, somebody who's, um, as they say in the Jewish tradition, may his memory be for a blessing, and it certainly is. So thank you all for joining us here today to see this gorgeous um, kitchen at Timberlake and help us dedicate it in his name and in his honor. And I'm correct, right, Jen? This is, oh, I'm going to let Rebecca do it, right? But now is the time for the popcorn cameras. Yeah. We're going to um, do just sharing your memories. Um, we have just to give us a sense of time frame, 15 minutes for the group. So if you're, you know, kind of thinking that's like a minute-ish. Person. I'm going to pass the mic around again so we can so we can hear each other. Um, but a chance to just share reflections and memories and thoughts of of Al Hicks. Just 
some of you know who I am, Bob Owen, some of you don't. Um, I first came to FNW in the summer of 1960, uh, as a, having just graduated, finished my junior year in college. And I came early, in early June, uh, to earn some extra money before camp started. When I arrived, the first two people I met were Al Hicks and Tom Kessinger. And I didn't know either one of them. And we chatted a little bit. And at dinner that night in the farmhouse, uh, Ken came into the farmhouse and said, I'm going to Shattuckie tonight. Uh, who would like to ride with me? And of the four or five people in there, nobody raised their hand. But <laughs> later on, I learned that Ken's driving was something that you wanted to be careful to be part of. But, uh, not very long into the silence, Al picked up and said, Bob would like to go with you. <laughs> I went. Uh, but uh, that was my introduction to Al. And in that couple of weeks before camp started, uh, we got acquainted with Mike Olenberg down at Olenberg store, who was about our age. And Kess and Al and I joined the softball team that he played in the league in and uh, played in games uh, before camp started. Uh, Al and I and Dottie and Dave Perkins also climbed Shrewsbury Peak. Um, over the next, uh, well, 20, almost 25 years, Al became a very, very special friend. Um, we frequently, on nights off, would go into the movie theater in Lolo, and Al would borrow Clara Hicks' car, his sister, who was uh, working at the farm, cooking, and we'd go to the movie, and then we'd come back um, at probably 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night, driving probably 25 miles an hour listening to classical music on QXR, which is the New York classical radio station, which you could pick up at night. Al loved classical music, he loved the opera. And in the wintertime, he was a frequent attender of the, the Met. Um, it's very hard to put in the feelings about Al. Um, he, I only saw him angry once, really angry. And he, at that point, was, was, uh, was cooking at IB, and IB had some cast iron griddles that they used for cooking pancakes and things on. And some of the staff would go up into the kitchen at night when Al was long since in bed, and uh, some of the staff used a couple of the griddles and made the big, big mistake of then washing them and scouring them afterward. And Al came into the kitchen the next morning and found his nice cast iron seasoned griddles that were no longer seasoned, and he blew his stack. That was the only time I really saw it. Al took me up to the dogs game and introduced me to Sticky Buns, uh, which later on got introduced to the whole camp community at, at fair dinners, or end of camp dinners. Um, but uh, we spent a lot of time uh, talking. In the wintertime, Al, who at that point was living in Boston, but then later moved to New York because of the, the very difficult racial feelings in Boston, where he didn't feel very comfortable. Um, uh, was a person who, in the wintertime, he, he disappeared. You, you, you'd ask him, make an appointment to go see him or meet him somewhere, and he wouldn't show up. And he lived a very private, different kind of life in the wintertime. One of the things he said to me once about camp, and I think it was in the context of a board meeting when I was serving on the board, and so was Al, and there began be discussions about racial feelings and interactions. He, he stood up and said, uh, I don't want to talk about this. He said, I, I come here and this is a place that nobody needs to talk about it. We just do the things we do together and we're comfortable with everybody and I really don't want to want to debate this. And uh, sat down and the rest of us kind of thought about that for a while. 
Um, a funny thing, well it wasn't funny for Al, uh, he referred to something back in the 1950s when he was new to camp. Um, he apparently was walked down to the IB waterfront with either with somebody or on his own just trying to see what it was and, and got down there and here were the IB girls swimming with no suits and he said he was absolutely terrorized. He, he went back up those paths about as fast as he could because he said where I came from that would be a lynching. Just, just watching. But uh, Al um, for most of the years that he was working at the camps that I knew him would bring up uh, some of the boys from his neighborhood, sometimes from the school where he taught. He taught history. Uh, uh, African-American black kids who'd never been out of the city and those were his kitchen boys and would help them in the kitchen. What really was going on, Al was teaching these kids responsibility. Um, he didn't pull any punches about if you had a job to do out here, you you did it the right way, you did it on time. He um, uh, helped them in terms of what their interaction should be with campers uh, and other counselors. And more importantly, or equally importantly, found out in bits and pieces over the years, a number of those kids he paid for to go to college out of his own money and, and encouraged them encourage them that they could do something uh, where otherwise in terms of what they grew up in uh, the environment that probably would not have happened. Uh, uh, when I got married, uh, Al welcomed my wife and when we had kids uh, we'd go up and Al always had chocolate chip cookies for them so <laughs> even though they were quite young at that point um, they remember who he, who he was. Um, the, he died in 1984, as you know, uh, in the fall of, of colon cancer. Um, and 1984 was the first uh, season with a full lake uh, after the dam had been condemned and rebuilt. And so it was a, it was a time of celebration at some level because of the, the dam uh, being replaced and the camps uh, uh, being able to go forward. And some of us were up on the platform, Rich Satterthwaite, myself, um, and Al and Ken, um, and what many people did not know was that uh, both Ken and Al had a very short time to live. And so the, the contrast of that didn't, didn't make any sense to me. Um, and uh, Al held forth on a garbage can, sitting right inside the door of, his, uh, of the uh, kitchen there at the last fair that he was at. And uh, that was his throne and all of the people that knew him, cared about him, one by one appeared and uh, that was the, the last time that I saw him alive. So, he's a person uh, that truly was a, a very important person in my life uh, in many different ways, uh, a true friend and uh, probably even though I grew up in Detroit, probably the first really close uh, black person who was a friend. And we just were very comfortable with each other. So um, uh, it, it's, it's very important to look around and knowing how many of you knew him. And I'm not saying anything you didn't already know probably, but, uh, uh, and uh, I've seen Jack here and, and I know that uh, Jack Hunter was a very special person in an house book. <clears throat> I wonder if we'll see uh, 
a lot of familiar old faces. Francis, Helen, Paul. I started here in 1969, and I have a unique perspective about Al because I had to work for him. I worked in the kitchen at TL in uh, 1971, and then I worked for Mabel, his mom, and I'd be in 72. And some great stories. I mean, there's a million kitchen stories. But Sunday, Sunday meals were probably the biggest thing on his list. You know, the sticky buns were, were mixing 50 pounds of flour <laughs> in, in the big mixers. And he said, you didn't break enough eggs. He said, you're not breaking the eggs fast enough. But he said it in a way that let you know that you could do it. You could meet the expectations because that has how he showed it. Sh sh had shown his love for you. And, and that's what really was about, Al was about. He loved everybody. You know, with skill and dedication and commitment. And, and that's what he means to me. That sort of shining light, that energy, uh, that I learned skills from him. But I also learned about F and W in that way. Because here, you learn about yourself from the inside out and the outside in. And, and I've been blessed to be around this place for 49 years. And my family has been here since the beginning. My uh, step-uncle, Bob Winnie, Merle, Gladdy, everybody that you know, means anything to me in my life is here. And, and one of the funny stories about Al, real quickly, was that if you're washing a woman in pans and the dishes, it best be, if you were white, your hands came out pink or red <laughs> out of the dishwater because it wasn't hot enough. And, and his mom, Mabel, was even tougher. <laughs> and, and, oh, these aren't clean. Back, they all go into the dishwater. So, and it was so important to him to make sure everybody had the kind of food that he would like to eat. And so he put pieces of himself and everything he did. Thank you. My name's Jan Klotz. I came to Timberlake in 1966. <clears throat> and over the course of the next 10 years, Al became one of my best friends. Um, as many of you know, the best way to keep young boys and young men happy is to feed them. <laughs> and so we would, he had a, a special shelf in the kitchen that had staff food for later that night. And uh, once in a while it was abused and uh, Al would come to our Sunday night staff meetings that were originally up here. And if you had been messing in his kitchen, you were in trouble. And he said, okay, you play ball with me and I'll play ball with you. <laughs> of course, in, Tim in Timberlake fashion, we all joke, yeah, because it's his ball and his feel. <laughs> So you're darn right we will. So, so that's how I got to got to know Al and worked with him, well, really for for ten years. I often stayed at his house in Brooklyn, and he was just he was just a, a prince of a man. So when when Rich called in 1984, it was the saddest day of my life. It was it was really sad. So, I remember Al Hicks, and I'm always glad to say something about him. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Seth Gibson. I work at another camp now. Uh, I was Al Hicks' roommate for many years. Uh, I was here from 62, from 52 to 65. First years I was here, we lived in a tent down by the waterfront. I won't say the tent beaks, but we referred to it as leaked like a sneaker. 
whenever it rained, everybody had to wake up quick and move your beds because you had to get out from under the leaks. I think it was Al and Seth and Pete Schilder, maybe Nick Eckerath's in there. And then somebody took pity on Al and built what we call the Hicks Hilton cabin up on the hill. And Al reached out and said, Seth, you want to want to sleep up there? And I was the driver at that point, the big blue truck. Had some crazy hours. And I said, yeah. So I moved up there, and many a time I would come back from dropping a trip in Maine or someplace far away at, at 12, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. And I would crawl in and he'd say, Gibson, what time is it? It's 2 a.m. Good, I'll get up and make breakfast. And I would get up and go make breakfast. He, uh, he was a teacher in Boston where I grew up. And I can remember one time, Mickey Cochran was talking to him about teaching in Boston when he was thinking of moving to New York. He said, Al, do you know Lee, Louise Day Hicks, who's chairman of the school board in Boston? And Al said, yeah, we don't talk about her. She's the white sheep of our family. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was a man that people would follow anywhere. Uh, we mentioned sticky buns, three people mentioned sticky buns with him, and believe it or not, when Al gets through cooking sometimes, he would come back and say, Gibson, let's go have dinner. Okay. I had just driven somewhere, we'd jump in my car, and we'd go up to the dog team in Middlebury, which in that time was further away than it is now. <laughs> and he, it's great to go out to dinner with Al because he always knows the chef. And he always goes in and says, what's good? And the chef says, I'll fix you. And brings out something. And so Al had sticky buns, and he talked to the chef and said, could I get the recipe for that? And so the chef gave him the recipe. And I thought, oh, wow. And I kept waiting for sticky buns to appear. And about three or four weeks later, he said, Kitchen, let's go out and have dinner again. We went to the dog team again, and Al had this bag with him. And in the bag was a tin of sticky buns going to the dog team. And he went into the chef, and he gave him the pan of sticky buns and asked the chef if those were okay. Because before Al could make them, he had to have the approval of that original chef to make sure he had done it correctly. And he got the approval, and thus brought back sticky buns to a timber lake in Indian Brook and Tamarack. Al is a man we'd follow anywhere. And it was amazing the number of people who followed him and would follow him anywhere. And I was pleased to be his roommate for those 10 years in the little Hicks Hill there. Even though we didn't see each other very often, because I'd come in at 2 and he'd leave at 2 o'clock. <laughs> We had a great time. Thank you, Al, for lending us your time. I came here as a camper. 1957. I was here for a long time, camper and counselor. And Al was a, I didn't know him really well, but he was a strong presence. He really was. He was one of those folks who. And when he was around, it felt a little different. He was one of a good number of people in this place who, just the way they seem to be living their own lives, and the way they seem to be treating all the people around them and treating you, just had a way of putting your head in the right place and putting your, putting your feet on the right path. And um, my kids have been here. My granddaughter's about to come here. Um, people like Al made a lot of difference in a lot of people's lives. But beside looking backwards, what I was just thinking sitting here now was how many good people have kept those traditions alive? And that's really hard for an organization. I'm looking back over half a century and it's still going strong. And uh, I want to thank those folks. Keep doing wonderful work. My name is Paul Stone, and I remember one of those uh, summers of Seth Gibson sleeping in that leaky tent um, down by the uh, TF uh, campfire circle. And uh, back then it wasn't it was um, called the farm. It wasn't TF at that time. So some of you probably remember that. But um, Al, we've we've heard so many great stories that it's it's hard to add to that. But uh, I was a farmer here in 73 to 76, and uh, I remember uh, 
one day I really made Al's day. Was, I grew some collard greens out there in the garden. <laughs> I, when, I, when I brought those collard greens in, boy, Al was ecstatic. He really loved that. And I just, I think about Al a lot. We visited him in um, uh, New York and uh, in the, not the Bronx, in the Brooklyn. Brooklyn, Brooklyn. Brooklyn yeah, he lived on Brooklyn Avenue. But That's all. right. <laughs> <laughs> he took us over to the school where he was teaching. It was over near the, the Port Authority bus, bus terminal over there, and it was just like this factory thing. And he said, it's too dangerous to be around here. I'm going to drive by real quick, and we're going to get out of here. So I think it was because of a couple of white people in his car with him. So at any rate, I just remember how so, so much, and... The stories could go on and on, and he's just a wonderful person. Thank you. I brought some photographs from the 84 fair with Al and Ken sitting together. So some photographs from the 84 fair of Al and Ken to take a look at. Maybe two more, and then we'll... Um, there are two more. I have um, words to read from. Yes. Okay. So we have a um, somebody who's not here. Um, Al's family had hoped to be here today, but um, his sister George Ellen, when she, we were talking about the day, um, realized that there's both a high school graduate <coughs> and a family wedding. This uh, so, but George Ellen wrote. <coughs> The family of Alfred Hicks is grateful to the Farm and Wilderness Camps for remembering him by dedicating the new Timberlake kitchen in his honor. Al's affiliation with the camps started in 1951 as a cook during the summer months while in college, was interrupted by his service in the U.S. Army, and continued throughout his teaching career in Boston and New York. Over a period of several years, he brought family members into the camps. His mother, Mabel, his sisters, Clara and George Ellen, worked numerous summers at Indian Brook and the farm, and eight nieces and nephews attended as campers. It is fair to say that Al's family is tied to farm and wilderness as much as farm and wilderness is to him to this day. It is obvious that his influence extended far beyond the kitchen as a cook. Even younger relatives who did not attend as campers grew up hearing wonderful stories of Al's love and dedication to the camps, as well as the family's history of participation and service to the camps. During the last year of his life, Al's dedication to farm and wilderness was unwavering. By then, he had been associated with F&W some 33 years and had participated in many decisions made by the board. Undoubtedly, he had deep, lasting friendships with people he worked with and met at the camps. We are humbled that you, his farm and wilderness family, would remember his work and commitment and love of the camps by dedicating the new Timberlake kitchen in his honor. Please share our joy and appreciation with all who made this possible, the family of Alfred Hicks. the table and there are other remembrances of Al also up there um, if you'd like to at the end go and enjoy them. I think um, why don't we move on to Tulio if you would do the unveiling. I don't think I need that. I'm pretty used to. Oh, do I? Okay, great. All right, I'm not used to this. Outside my comfort zone. Pretty used to speaking on my too. All right. So, we uh, diaphragm, right? Yeah. Um, so, if I can briefly address a little bit more from the then to the now, because I do want to take a moment um, right now to also explain what this amazing facility means in the current moment because this is an Al Hicks memory. And somebody was, was mentioning, like, how would Al see this kitchen? And, you know, I came here in the day after he, I mean, not the day, the year after he passed. I came in 85, that was my first summer. So 
Um, I can't answer that because I didn't know him, but at the same time, I do know that Farm and Wilderness, in the past, embraced a challenge. There was other summer camps, they went one path, and they went the path of motorboats and megaphones and music and you know, food that was easy to prepare, pizzas that came frozen, and little cups of pudding and jello and all those kind of things. We always took the path of, we have a farm, we have a garden, and you already heard testimony to that kind of reaching out as a culinary individual and trying to push those boundaries and stay on that edge and be the best for people. And this is a new challenge we live in. We live in an era where folks need different things from a kitchen and a whole, whole variety to be healthy and successful here. It's, it's changed and it's different. And this building right now is really well suited to make that happen. This building right now is in such great shape to support every single person that comes here. Every single person, we can take care of them so much better right now. And that's, that's something to be really proud of. And I do want to just make one other thank you. Um, because Jay is at the back here, Jay Coleman, and Jay is, can you just stand up for a second, Jay? Thank you. Jay has really worked hard. <laughs> This, this, all this work, all this meeting with people and all this negotiating with, with fire marshals and with all the different levels of, of bureaucracy and with all the different folks who need to coordinate to make this work happen on time, it's not easy when you have from one season to another, this is a huge effort and it's going really, really well because of the people that put in that effort. I just want to say thank you and maybe give a big round of applause. And before we unveil, I'd also just like to thank this culture and community for naming this after Al, because he was the person who made this place great. He was the person who made this place great, because as far as I can tell, I'm kind of new to development, but it seems like a lot of places get named for the people who got great because of the place. <laughs> so <laughs> and that, that's how it works, that's fine, that's the way of them paying it back. But this is the person who made this great, and that's um, why I'm really happy to be able to, to dedicate this. The person who painted this, is a current staff member. Um, their name is Nico Palasi. They live in, oh. in New York City. And um, they have painted the, the picture, but we also are really looking forward. He's also the art director this summer. So we look forward to creating a frame around this that is something that the, art, the campers will you know, put their, their extra effort and love into. And I think Al would have wanted that way. So. Uh, without further ado, we'll go ahead and unveil this. Oh, wow. To turn, to turn, it will be our delight. 